Um, Hey, what I love about the church is that we can be the church and we can do what we do uh, kind of across everything that we face, man, and every barrier. And so thank you all so much uh, for just being who you are. Uh, I love being your pastor, but more than anything, I love seeing uh, just the story of faith and life that God is weaving uh, in amongst you guys. And I mean that. I was sitting there and I was just thinking uh, as we were even singing those last couple songs, um, this life that we do isn't easy. And I know over the last few weeks we've been talking about some issues that have arisen out of Malachi chapter 2 and chapter 3. And if you've been around, we've really been kind of drilling down on the issues of is God good? Does he care about good and evil in the world? And and if he does, why does it seem at moments like he doesn't do anything about the evil that we see? And so we've talked about the idea that God is good in his essence and his purpose and his promise and that everything about who God is is good and that everything that God does is good and that we see both these truths ultimately in the gospel of Jesus and the gospel of a God who came down in human form and gave his life on the cross for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, that we might go from being dead to being alive, that we might go from being far off to being near, that we might go from being enemies of God to being sons and daughters of God. And then we talked about the fact that not only is God good, but he doesn't change. That he literally is unchanging in his essence, that who he says he is in the Old Testament, that any part of who God was from the beginning of time is who God is for all of time. Any part of who God will be in time is already who God is now, that he is absolutely steady and unchanging in who he is. But he's also unchanging in his promise. And we talked about the idea that God, God's purpose is to raise up a people for his name through his power and through his grace and for his glory. And because of that, his promise to us is unchanging. And that the promise is that God will do what he said he will always do. And last week, if you were here, we talked about the fact that what that means is that God will judge sin the way that he says he will judge sin. But the promise is that he will also bring salvation just as much. That the same God that will judge every sin, that will judge everyone, is also the same God who has promised to save us from our sins through the person of Jesus Christ. But if we are honest together this morning... It's one thing to hear those truths, isn't it? It's one thing to sit through a sermon about those truths. It's one thing to read those truths about God's goodness and God's unchanging nature and His unchanging purpose and promise. If we can can just be honest, it's a whole different thing to believe it, isn't it? It's a whole different thing to act on it. And if I can be honest with you, there have been moments in my own life, in my own journey, where I've had to face, do I really believe this? Do I really believe the words I sing? Do I really believe the words I preach? Do I really really believe it? And do I believe it enough to act on it, to live on it? Because hearing the truth, even believing the truth, isn't the same as hearing it and believing it and receiving it in such a way that it changes who we are and what we do. And so this morning what I want to do is we're going to finish up our time in Malachi this morning and I want us to look at what I think are some real practical truths about faith and about a faith that is living, not a faith that is lifeless. A faith that is real, not a faith that's faith. And so I want us to look at Malachi chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 7. I'm going to read through verse 18 together. This is what scripture says. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. 
verse 13, Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord, but you say, How have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. And the Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared God and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession. And I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves them. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Would you pray with me? <coughs> Father, we thank you so much for the day. We thank you for your word, God. We thank you that you are unchanging. We thank you that you are good. And Lord, we thank you that you desire a relationship with us. You desire to show yourself to us. And so we pray today that you might open your word to our hearts and to our minds. And God, let us see and understand who you are, that we may walk out of this place changed, full of faith, and ready to live as the people of God in the world around us. Lord, we love you so much. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Uh, so I've been fighting laryngitis for about the past week. So I'm going to do a little bit of coughing today. I'm sorry. I'm going to try not to cough into the mic like I just did. Uh, I remembered it was there. Um, but I want you to look back because we need to look at a question that's here. Look back at verse 7. The last half of verse 7. And look at the question. He says, from the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. And God says this. He says, return to me and I will return to you. Now, if you've been here, we talked about this idea of return means to turn around, to turn back to something. But really the idea of the word is to turn from one thing and to turn to another thing. And so God looks at these people and is pleading with them to turn from their doubt. We talked about the fact that in this moment of history, the nation of Israel is discouraged. They're disillusioned. All the promises that they thought would happen when they came back from exile haven't happened. There is no glory. There is no prosperity. There is none of the things that the prophets said would happen has happened. And so God says, look, turn. Turn from your doubt. Turn from your discouragement. Turn from your bitterness. And turn back to me. And this is really the hope of this book. It's this idea of turning. If you said, Joe, over the past eight weeks, what, what's the one thing that I should walk away from in this book? I would tell you it's the idea of return. It's the idea that the hope for our faith when it feels lifeless, the hope for our faith when it feels like it's hanging by a thread, is that any of us can turn from the things that have drawn us away from the presence and the power of God. And that God will restore us. I want to read you a couple verses early in, in the Old Testament in Leviticus right in the middle of the law being handed down God says this he says if then their uncircumcised heart is humbled and they make amends for their iniquity then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and I will remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land what he's talking about is look you're going to get it wrong is what God says but when you do if you will turn to me then I will remember my covenant with you and Deuteronomy, in the very first part of the book, God is talking with Moses. And Moses says this to the people. He says, from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him. If you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. Then in verse 31, he goes on. He says, for the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you. He will not forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. And so look, this idea of returning that we see in Malachi, this is something that the Israelites have had from the very beginning of their nation. From the moment that they left Egypt and they became more than just a collection of tribes, but they became a people, a people with a God. This idea of return has been there. But I want you to look at the response that the people have. When God says, return to me and I will return to you, they say, but you say, how shall we return? And in the English, uh, that sounds like a really legitimate question, right? Like, hey, God, you tell us to come back to you. Well, how are we supposed to do that? Here's what we miss in this, is that in the Hebrew, there's a negative conjunction here that we don't get. So literally what this really should read is, but we don't have to return. Or why do we have to return? You see, this is framed in a negative sense so that the people are saying, why? 
You say return to you, but we don't have to return. We haven't gone anywhere. We haven't done anything. It reminds me of when Sarah was teaching intermediate school right after we got married in music. She was teaching in a school district south of Dallas. And I remember she would tell me this all the time, but I went to go help her one day. And man, she would call on a kid that was doing something wrong. And immediately they, immediately they'd be like, Mr. Man, what'd I do? What'd I do, Miss Irvan? And she kept telling me that. I was like, there's no way those kids are like in, instantly just saying that all day long. What'd I do? Anyone who's a teacher, college students, still will be like, what'd I do? All right? It's funny, even as adults, I'll get called out for something. I'll be like, what'd I, what, what'd I do? You know? Husbands, you, you know what I'm saying. I didn't do nothing. This is what the people are saying to God. God says, look, you've gotten discouraged. You've gotten disillusioned. You've started to doubt. And in the midst of that, you've left the very heart of who I am. And so return to me. And their response is, what did we do? We didn't do nothing. We didn't go nowhere. And look at what God says. God says this. He says they didn't think that they had a need or they'd done anything wrong. But he goes on and he says, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In the verse 8, in your tithes and contributions. Now look, Malachi is going to do something here that he's done the entire book, which is that he's going to frame the lesson about faith in some very negative illustrations. And if you've been around for any part of this book, that's what's kind of happened the whole way. This book is a series of dialogue between God and the people. It's a series of questions, but they're always negative. The illustrations are negative. The questions are negative. The ac accusations are negative. And so he does the same thing. And he's going to take two really negative illustrations, I think, to teach us about faith. And the first one is that real faith, a living faith, trusts God to provide. Do you see what he said in verse 8? His instant response is, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. And that word for rob meant to take something precious that isn't yours. God is accusing them of taking what wasn't there, something that was precious, and keeping it for themselves. And when they say, how have we robbed you? God doesn't really hold back, does he? He instantly says, in your tithes and in your offerings. Now, I realize we don't want to hear that. Because for a lot of us, that hits really close to home. But can I tell you why this was such a big deal? Why tithing was so important? I want you to turn to the book of Numbers. It'll be on the screen for you as well. But I want to read to you Numbers chapter 18. Verses 21 to 24. Israel has gone into the promised land. They've split up. It's been apportioned. And God kind of begins telling everyone what they're going to get and how things are going to go. And he comes to the Levites and he separates the Levites out for himself. And he says this in Numbers 18, 21 to 24. To the Levites, I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service that they do. Their service in the tent of meeting. So that the people of Israel do not come near to the tent of meeting lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall do the service of the tent of meetings and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and among the people of Israel they shall have no inheritance. For the tithe of the people of Israel which they present as a contribution to the Lord I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore I have said to them that they shall have no inheritance among the people of Israel. Now look the reason that this is important is because the Levites were to be a physical reminder to the people of God that God would provide for them. They had been set apart to do the service of worship, to do the service of the sacrifice, to take care of the national religion of Israel. And so because of that, God says, look, they don't get inheritance. They don't get blocks of land that they get to grow and they get to develop and they get to get their provision and their living off of. Their provision, their inheritance comes from me. And they are to be a reminder to you that your provision and your inheritance ultimately comes from me. And for all of us, every single one in this room, even if you're not a Jesus follower in this room right now, I want you to hear from me that your only inheritance, your only portion, your only source of provision is the God who owns it all anyway. He is the only one. He is our inheritance and He is our portion. He is the one that will satisfy us daily and forever. I want to back up real fast to you and read to you Numbers 18, verse 20. And the Lord said to Aaron... 
who's heading up the Levitical order, he says, You shall have no inheritance in their land, neither shall you have any portion among them. Why? Because I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. Now look, you may hear that and you may say, well, Joe, he's talking to the priest, right? So that means he's talking to ministers now. Wrong. He's not. Here's how we know that's wrong. This is a word for Israel. You're not Israel. I'm not Israel. Okay, we have been adopted into who Israel is, the New Testament tells us, which means that the application of this verse isn't just to the priest because I'm not a priest of Israel. I don't belong to the nation. I don't belong to the people. So the application has to be wider. So the application for us is this. God is our only portion and inheritance. It doesn't matter if we're priests or not. Because we've been adopted into the family, the reminder for us is the same as the reminder for the people. The Levites were called out to be a physical reminder in front of them that God was the only one that could provide for them. Because if the people didn't bring their tithes, they didn't bring their offerings, then the Levites didn't eat. And the only thing that they could do was to maybe leave their service and go out and try to eke out a meager living in the little bit of space that they had. But otherwise, that was it. There was no backup plan. The backup plan was that they had to trust God to provide. So the application for us is this is how open-handed, how free are you with your giving? How open-handed, how free are you with your money? And the reason why is this, because how free we are with our money, how generous we are with the things that we have, our time and our homes and our stuff and our finances, it's a really good test of where our faith is. You know why? Because it tests whether or not we really believe God is our portion and our inheritance. It tests and it gives a temperature on do we really trust God to provide or do I trust me to provide? Do I really trust God to provide or do I trust my degree to provide? Do I trust God to provide or do I trust my job and my intelligence and my bank account and my retirement? Do I trust God to provide or do I trust the stock market? Do I trust God to provide or do I trust the government? Do I trust God to provide or do I trust a politician? Do you trust God to provide? Or are you trusting in something else so that when the option comes up of the stuff that you own, your instant response is not this, but this. It's to pull it in tight. It's to hold it close. It's to say, God, I can't. I can't let it go because I've got to pay these bills. I've got to pay off my student loans. I've got car notes. I've got credit cards. I've got a mortgage. I've got kids. I've got to buy diapers and formula. All right? I've got to go to school. God, I can't give right now. I'm just not in the season of life to. How open-handed we are with our money is a direct correlation to where our faith is. I want to give you two biblical examples. First is Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was wealthy by all means. Jesus comes to his town. Zacchaeus is pretty stoked to see him if you know this story. But he's a short guy. Nothing wrong with that. All right. And so in order to see Jesus, he scales a tree. All right. So that he can see Jesus. Jesus comes by, sees him, calls him down and says, hey, Zacchaeus, I'm going to come and eat at your house. Jesus goes to eat at his house. And this is Zacchaeus' response to encountering Jesus. Luke chapter 19, verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone anything, I restore it fourfold. Now here's what's remarkable about this. He didn't have to do this. He was only obliged to give a tithe of his wealth anyway to God. Not half of it. And if he had stolen anything or cheated anyone out of anything, the law of Moses said that all he had to do was to restore double, not fourfold. So for Zacchaeus to say, hey, I'm going to give half of what I own away, and if I've cheated anyone, I'm going to restore double what the law requires me to restore. And look at Jesus' response. Jesus' response is that salvation had come to his house. Not because Zacchaeus was giving his money away, but because his willingness to give it away was a sign of the faith that now lived in Zacchaeus' heart. Do you notice he says, Lord? He says, Behold, Lord, I'm going to give all of this away. In other words, God, the one that is above me, the one that is in charge of me, because of you. I'm going to do this. 
It was a result. It was a sign of the faith that lived in his heart because now he knew that the same God that had saved him was the same God that was going to provide for him. The other example is in Mark chapter 10. It's a story about what the Bible calls a rich young ruler. And what I love about the story is in Mark 10, this young man doesn't just come to see Jesus. It says that he ran to come and to see Jesus. He was so eager, he was so desperate to get to the Savior that he runs and he comes searching for truth, searching for the same forgiveness and rescue that Zacchaeus had found. And so he gets to Jesus and he says, Teacher, what must I do to be saved? Now look, that's the question. That's the question every preacher wants to hear from someone. Is what must I do to be saved? And Jesus' response is interesting. Jesus says, well, he says, obey all the commandments. And the guy says, oh, I'm good. He says, if that's all it is, then man, I've done that from the day I was born. I've obeyed all the commandments. Now look, he's instantly lying, right? I've got three kids. Let me tell you, he's instantly lying. He hasn't, he hasn't like held up all the commandments since he was born, but he says, I've obeyed all of them since my birth. And then Jesus says this. He says, okay, he says, one thing you lack. And he says, go away. Look at verse 20 to 22. I want to read this. He says, Teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. And Jesus looked at him and loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. Verse 22. But disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful. Why? For he had great possessions. Jesus asked him if his belief and his obedience is real. If it is, do you really trust me? Do you really trust me enough to give up all that you have, all that you have taken your comfort and your security in? If you do, then come follow me. But he can't, because the truth is, is that the rich young ruler held more faith in his stuff than he did in his Savior. He held more, more faith in the things that he had accumulated than in what God had done for him in Jesus. And church family, if I'm honest with you, this is the problem of the church in America. Now, we've got a lot of different problems along the way, right? And if you know me, i got more probably than anyone else, else in this room. But at the core of us, the problem is that we don't trust God. Because if we did, there would not be a church in our country that could contain all of the offerings that would pour in. There wouldn't be a community in our country that would be in need, that would be in poverty, that would struggle with the things that we struggle to fix because there would be so many resources that we would be able to do what it is that God desires for us to do to help the people around us, to care for people around us, to solve the problems that we see around us. But the truth is we don't. Do you see what God says to Malachi? Look at verse 10. He says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. And see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down a blessing for you, a blessing until there is no more need. Now that word for test that Malachi uses meant to examine something in order to determine its essential qualities. This is the only time in the Bible that God says, Test me. He says, examine me. See if I really am who I say I am. See if I really will do what I've said I will do. Because if you do, if you'll test me in this, if you'll trust me in this, I will pour out such a blessing on you that there won't be room enough for you to contain it. I love the image he gives. You see the image he gives? That I will open the windows of heaven for you. You know the first time we see that picture? We see it in Genesis chapter 7 when Noah gets into the ark and God shuts him in and it says that the windows of heaven opened up and poured down. And the image is that we literally would be overwhelmed by the provision of God if we would just trust Him to provide. Sarah and I worked for a pastor when we first got married and I used to love how Danny would say this. Danny would say that a faith that doesn't trust God with its checkbook isn't much of a faith at all. And I love that. A faith that wouldn't trust God with its bank account or its retirement account or its wallet. A faith that wouldn't trust God with its money. It's not much of a faith at all. 
Because God says, look, put me to the test. See if I will not provide for you. And look at the promise. Look at the promise that he gives in verse 11 and 12. Because it's not just that he'll provide blessings for us. But he says, I will rebuke the devourer for you. So that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. And your vine in the field shall not fail to bear fruit. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord. The lesson, the promise is this, is that when we trust God to provide, we will never be without. We may not have all that we want, but man, we will never not have what we need. We will never not have more than we need, if, if we can just be honest with you. When Sarah and I uh, were first married and we were just kind of living without kids, both of us were working. And she mentioned this a little bit last week. But we just lived a lifestyle that was all about us. And, and man, we went on vacations and we bought cars and we remodeled kitchens and we bought furniture. And we lived way beyond our income because we were chasing a lifestyle. And we didn't give hardly anything during those first five to six years. I mean, Sarah was right. We would do like maybe one shoebox, maybe two, if we even did that. We would tithe every once in a while. But man, we went on vacation all the time. We bought clothes all the time. We bought cars, we went out to eat. We did everything that we wanted to do until we looked up and we were $60,000 in debt. $40,000 on credit cards and a $20,000 car note. And for the most part, I had hidden most of, the, most of it from Sarah. We were just enjoying it. I could see the numbers racking up, but I was, I was ashamed, if I'm honest with you, about what was going on. And so I just didn't tell her how bad it was. Until finally, after Ella was born, things were just so bad that it was literally, it, it was, I couldn't make the payments anymore to the point that I was Googling bankruptcy lawyers because I just, I didn't know what to do. And God began to really grab a hold of me in the midst of that. And he really began to grab a hold of me because he began to say, Joe, what do you trust in? Do you trust in me? Or do you trust in all this stuff that you've been chasing after? And so we began to pay off that debt. And man, like it was tight. I'm telling you for a couple years, like there was no margin whatsoever. But God began to do something amazing. It was, in fact, if I'm honest with you, it was literally ridiculous. Sarah wasn't working in that season of time. She was at home. In fact, I had pushed her to go out and work because I knew we needed the money. And like, there was just no job. And God paid off $60,000 in debt in our lives in the course of three years. From the spring of 2010 to the spring of 2013 on one income. And he did it in ways that I couldn't even explain. We ended up having Ruby in Texas because of losing Sarah's mom. And, and so we had this huge hospital bill of like almost $5,000 from there. And I literally just wrote a letter to the hospital and said, hey, we can't pay this all in one go. And we just need help. And then we didn't hear anything back, man. So I'm like, how are we going to pay $5,000 more of medical debt on top of all this other that we're doing? And then all of a sudden I get another bill about two months later from the hospital that has a zero on it. And I call the hospital, I'm like, hey, um, I got a bill and it has zero. Is that a joke? And they were like, well, let me check. And they were like, hey, so your account's been wiped out. And I was like, but we didn't, we didn't hear anything. They were like, no, they just, they wiped it out, man, you're good. And I was like, are you sure? <laughs> like, I must have asked like five times, man. Because we had friends through this process that would swear to us that God would provide. And I'm telling you, up until moments like that, I didn't believe it. But God was so faithful. Can I tell you, we hit another one of those spots. We moved here in January of 2017. Our house didn't sell for six months. And man, we just watched our savings whew, down to nothing. We watched some debt begin to pile up again just because we were making double mortgage payments. And I was like, God, I don't know what to do. Then we sold the house. We moved into the new house, got settled enough to all of a sudden get an audit letter for like 2015. And at that point, I'm like, seriously, Jesus? Like, come on, man. And I'm, I'm stressing, like I can feel my faith just beginning to whine on, is God really going to provide? And then literally someone put a check for $10,000 in our hands. And church family, I want to say to you, my experience is not because I'm a pastor. 
My experience is not because I'm more holy than you. My experience is not because I've done anything that deserves it. In fact, just to be real honest with you, if I know my own heart well enough, I don't deserve any of it. I don't deserve to stand here. I don't deserve to have the house I have or what God has provided for me. My experience is because when you trust God to provide, you will never be without. When you trust Him to provide, He will pour out the blessings of heaven on you. Because He wants to show you that He is good all the time. And His goodness is not based on what He gives us. His goodness is that He really does love us. He really does want to take care of us. He's not sitting in heaven waiting to knock us, waiting to hit us when we do bad. He's sitting in heaven waiting to care for us and to love us. And a faith that is real and that is living is a faith that trusts God to provide. Trust Him to provide, but also trust Him to prevail. Look at Malachi chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. Malachi says this, God says, you have, Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, How have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers, evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. I love how the New Living Translation says this first sentence. It says, You have said terrible things about me. In verse 13. And if you look at their list of accusations, look at what they say. They say it's vain to serve God. It's useless. It's futile to be committed to God. That word for serve is a word that meant total commitment. They say there is no profit in keeping this charge. In other words, there's no profit. There's no long-term good in obeying God. They say there's no good in mourning and walking as in mourning before the Lord. Now you know what that means? That word for mourning is the only time it's used in the entire Bible. And it's a word that meant to seek per protection. To walk in the midst of someone because there was nowhere else to go. And so what they say is, look, there's no good in being with God because He's not where you can go. He's not your refuge. He's not your strong tower. He's not your safe place. And the whole reason is because they look around them. If you notice, they say that evildoers we now call the arrogant blessed. And evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. The reason is that they see those who don't follow God having earthly success and earthly comfort and earthly prosperity. And they were doubting God's power and authority over the world around them. Here's where I think we fail to be honest, is that when we start getting jealous, when we start doubting that God really does care about good and evil because we see evil people getting good things, that really what our issue is, is not that they got something good. Our issue is that we didn't. And our issue is that in our hearts, we begin to believe that God really isn't going to do what he says he's going to do. That he really, he just really isn't. That all the things that the Bible says about God setting things right and about God judging people and bringing justice, that they really aren't true. And so what Malachi reminds us is that a living faith doesn't just trust God to provide, it also trusts God to prevail. It trusts God to have the power and the authority. It trusts God that in His promise of victory that He really will do all those things. Because that victory is our only hope. I want to read to you just a few verses. John 16, chapter, verse 33. Jesus says this. He says, In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. And 1 John 4, 4, the apostle says that you are from God, and you have overcome them, for He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Revelation 12, verses 10 and 11 says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. He accuses them day and night before our God, and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony, for they love not their lives unto death. This is a picture of the end times and Satan being vanquished forever. And this is this is the hope. The hope is that God really does win. 
in the end. The hope is not that everything goes our way. The hope is not that we get what we want or that our form of justice gets meted out. The hope is that God's form of justice gets meted out. The hope is that what God says, that he will set everything right, that he will judge the living and the dead, that he will make sure that everything is set back to the way he intended for it to be before sin entered into the picture. That that really will happen. That is our hope. But here's the trick. The trick is we have to believe it. Paul writes to the Hebrews and he says to them in chapter 11, he says, faith is the evidence, it's the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things not seen. And I think we miss that because what it means for us is that we have to choose to look at the world around us, to look at the brokenness and the oppression and the injustice and the things that are wrong, the sin. And we have to choose to believe that God really will put it all back right. That he really will restore everything the way he meant for it to be. We have to choose to look at our own circumstances, whether they're good or bad, whether it's financial abundance or it's lack, whether it's favor or persecution, whether it's happiness or grief. We have to choose to look at our own circumstances with faith that God will prevail, that he will set it right, that he will judge everything, that he will restore this world and the beauty and the joy that he meant for us and for creation, that he'll do it. We have to choose to believe it. The best illustration that I can give you is this, and I'm going to ask for anyone who knows me as a friend to not laugh too hard about this illustration, but imagine, just imagine that I was a marathon runner. Just let that sink in, all right? But imagine I had gone out to train, I had run like 20 miles before preaching, which A, will never happen unless zombies are chasing me, just in case you need a window in my, my heart. All right, but let's just say that I had gone out, I had run, I had done like a full training before a race next weekend. And I came back in and I'm obviously just worn out. Like I'm hot, like I'm, you can just see, like my legs are almost shaking from the distance. All right, and you pull this chair out and you're like, Joe, take a seat, man, you gotta preach in a little bit, rest. And I was like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'll, I'll be all right. I'll be able to do it. Don't worry about me. I appreciate it. And you're like, Joe, man, just sit down. Look, I've got this chair. It's right here for you. Just, you don't have to do anything. Just sit. And I'm like, no, it's okay. And you're like, Joe, why won't you sit? I'm like, well, look, I, I appreciate the chair. I see the chair. I'm all, I hear you saying I can sit down. But I'm just, I'm just going to keep standing on my own. Now, at some point, you would look at me and be like, Joe, why are you being ridiculous? Why won't you sit? Why won't you rest? Because here's the deal. Until I sit in the chair, until I not only hear that it's there for my benefit, see that it's there for my benefit, but until I actually experience it, have I really put my faith not only in this chair that's here, but in the fact that you wanted rest for me? that you wanted my good, that you wanted my benefit. I haven't, have I? I've heard it, I've seen it, I've told you I believe it. But as long as I'm still trying to stand up under my own power, under my own strength, it doesn't do me any good, does it? Church family, if I can be honest with you, there's a lot of anxiety and doubt and depression in your lives right now. And I'm not gonna call names, but I'm just being honest with you because I talk with you and I pray with you. And my heart as your pastor has become more and more burdened over the course of this fall because of what I know is going on in your lives. And can I tell you something? Sit in the chair. So many of you are worn out because it's here and you will not sit. God is saying, rest, trust me, trust me to take care of you, trust me to bring you victory, trust me to overcome what you're fighting, just sit down and you won't sit. You are convinced that you have to keep standing and I don't know why. Rest. Sit in the chair and trust God to provide and trust God to prevail. He loves you and he cares for you.